Thank you, Marie, for that uh, kind introduction. And I also would echo her uh, <coughs> words in congratulating everybody for getting here and getting through the weather. And it's very warm in here, which is nice. Um, look, for the next two hours, I think I've been told I've got up here, um, I'm going to talk about diabetes. And uh, um, I'm going to concentrate on type 2 only because uh, uh, Jenny Gunton will talk a little bit later about type 1 diabetes. And uh, I, I thought I'd just sort of cover a little bit about what diabetes is and the different types. I've been told that um, I've had to uh, take out all the rude words and rude pictures from my talk. So hopefully they've got the right one loaded up. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is the underlying nature of diabetes. What are the different types of diabetes? How big a problem is it? Who's actually at risk? Are all overweight and obese people at risk of developing type 2 diabetes? and a little bit about some new diabetes drugs. And throughout the talk, I'll try and highlight some of the research that, that has been done at the Garvin over the years and some of the projected research that is going to be done in the next few years. So um, this is a slide to really highlight the importance of the difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease, and many of you will be familiar with what that is. It essentially is when the body causes antibodies to uh, destroy certain tissues in the body, and in this case, it's the pancreas. It leads to beta cell destruction, and the treatment is with insulin in all cases. And that's thought to account for about 10% of diabetes. There's also type 2, and type 2 diabetes underlying it is what's called insulin resistance, and that's when insulin does not work as well in the body as it should. The beta cells which make insulin in the pancreas also become dysfunctional, so they don't make as much insulin as they should. They still make some, but not enough to keep the sugar level normal. And it's treated with lifestyle changes, with tablets, but also eventually with insulin therapy. And it's said that by about 10 years of having diabetes, about half of the people who have type 2 diabetes will require insulin. There's some new medications that have come out that might delay that, but about half the people with type 2 diabetes require insulin after about 10 years. And that all seems very well and good, and it's thought that people with type 1 are younger when they develop diabetes, and people with type 2 are older. But in fact, that's not true, and things have been turned on their head in the last few years. So essentially now we've got some people developing type 1 diabetes in their 50s and 60s and some, people, some children now developing type 2 diabetes. So there have been a number of studies that have been published around the world of children who are at school who are developing type 2 diabetes. And that's largely related to increased body fat, but it's also related to certain lifestyle factors. So now when we see people come uh, to our clinics, who are in their 40s and 50s, we can't really assume that they have type 2 diabetes. They might have type 1. And when we see younger people uh, who are uh, sometimes overweight, um, they, we can't assume that they've always got type 1 diabetes. So they're blurring of the lines now in terms of the type of diabetes that they've got. But of course, there are other types of diabetes. There's gestational diabetes. So this is diabetes that develops or is diagnosed during pregnancy. <laughs> And there's a number of other types of diabetes that we call secondary diabetes. So hemochromatosis is a condition where the body absorbs too much iron. And there are some people who have hemochromatosis who get diabetes. And we diagnose hemochromatosis in some people who present to our clinics. And that's a disorder of excess iron in the body. There's a couple of endocrine conditions called Cushing's, where you make too much steroid and acromegaly where you make too much growth hormone. And they can also present with diabetes. And in some patients who come through our clinics, we diagnose these conditions and we can actually treat them and the diabetes gets better. Lipodystrophy is another cause of diabetes where body fat is lost. So individuals lose body fat from the face, from the buttocks and from other parts of the body. Pancreatic cancer can occasionally present with diabetes and also cystic fibrosis. So the hospital has a very large um, lung transplant unit and there are patients there with cystic fibrosis, which is a genetic condition that causes the pancreas not to work and the lungs to not work. It develops and presents at a very young age and these individuals develop diabetes uh, at a very high rate. Now there are a large number of genetic causes of diabetes and I won't go into the details but this has been really one of the focuses of the girl, the foci of the Garvin particularly in the last few years. 
And we're now starting to appreciate that many of the types of diabetes that people have are due to genetic abnormalities. And one of the things that we're trying to set up at the moment is a unit to be able to screen people to see what the genetic basis for type 2 diabetes, but also type 1 diabetes is. And there are a number of programs that are going to be sort of developed and rolled out in the next few years that will try and answer these sorts of questions, because if we understand what the genetic basis of diabetes is, then we'll have a much better ability to try and develop targeted treatments to uh, reduce blood sugars in these individuals. And finally, of course, medication. This is probably one of the more common types of diabetes that we see that's not type 1 or type 2, is steroid-induced diabetes. And people who commence prednisone or other forms of steroids, it is very common for them to develop diabetes, particularly if they've got a predisposition through their genetics. And blood sugar levels in people who take prednisone, for example, in the morning, tend to be highest in the evening, and we're often called to see patients in the hospital who have steroid-induced diabetes. So this is just giving you a little bit of a breadth of the types of diabetes that we need to think about that's not type 1 and not type 2. So this is just a slide highlighting some of the complications of diabetes, and this is why I get up every morning, is to really try and prevent these things from developing. So we know that if we can reduce blood sugar levels, we can reduce the risk of heart attacks, of strokes, of, di of dialysis and renal failure from diabetes, and also from foot ulcers and other complications that I won't go through that are illustrated on this slide. So these are the things that we're really trying to prevent. And we know that if we reduce someone's HbA1c, which is a marker of their diabetes control, by 1% in absolute terms, then we can reduce the risk of complications by about 33%. So we use HbA1c as a marker of diabetes control. Many of you will be aware of that. If we can drop it from 8 to 7, for example, we can reduce the risk of these complications developing by about a third. All right, so how big a problem is it? So almost 400 million people are affected with diabetes in the world. And when it comes to diabetes, it's really the rules of halves. Half of them are diagnosed. Half of those actually receive treatment. Half of those who achieve treatment achieve their targets, who have received treatment achieve targets. And half of those actually achieve their desired outcomes. Now, what about Australia? We know that almost 5% of Australians are registered on the National uh, Diabetes uh, Scheme that registers people who have diabetes. There are about over a million people with diabetes. 87% are thought to have type 2 diabetes. So by far, and most of the common type of diabetes is type 2. There are almost 100,000 newly registered people every 12 months. And every day, 263 people are diagnosed with diabetes. So we're talking, or at least registering, with the body. So we're talking about a very, very common condition. It's ranked in the top 10 leading causes of death around the world and underlying cause of death in 3% of all uh, deaths that are listed. So the prevalence of diabetes, interestingly, varies from state to state. So if you look at the top, the Northern Territory, 6.3% of the population has diabetes. 91.1% is type 2. If you go to South Australia, it's a, a similar figure, 88% with type 2 diabetes. And if you go down New South Wales, 5.4% with 85% having type 2 diabetes. So it varies from state to state. But it also depends on where you live in, in New South Wales, if we're drilling down. So type 1 diabetes tends to be much more common in the coastal areas, whereas interestingly, if you look at type 2 diabetes, it tends to be much more prevalent in the inland areas. So there's a distribution around Australia which is variable, there's a different distribution within New South Wales. And these are interesting figures that I think are worthwhile noting. Now what about the financial constraints? Well these are older figures from 2012 from Diabetes Australia. And if you look at the annual cost of type 1 diabetes, it's about $570 million. The total annual cost per person, if there are no complications, is 3500 With microvascular complications, so eye disease and kidney disease, it's just over 8000 With heart disease and stroke, it's 12000 And if you've got both, it's almost $17,000. The type 2 diabetes, the annual cost is $6 billion. And you can see the figures that are listed here. So this is not only a very common disease, 
but it's also a very costly disease. So who's at risk of diabetes? Are all people who are overweight and obese uh, at risk of diabetes? And we've done a little bit of work in this area. So these are the uh, traditional risk factors for diabetes. Age over 60 years. So there's an increase in prevalence of diabetes as you get older. And I think over the age of 70 or 80, almost 50% of people have diabetes, so it's worthwhile getting screened. Genetics plays a major, major role. So if someone's got a family history of diabetes, particularly type 2 diabetes, then there's a much higher risk that their relatives will develop type 2 diabetes as well. So knowing your family history is very important. Now, there may be some individuals uh, in previous generations who had diabetes who didn't actually know it. So it sometimes makes it hard to say that there was no family history. Ethnicity, certain ethnic groups are at higher risk. Obesity. And we lose, use this term very, very loosely. It particularly refers to increased waist circumference, increased central adiposity. So we know that the more fat that you put around the belly, the higher the risk of diabetes and heart disease. And in fact, the more adipose tissue or fat tissue that you have in the bottom and hips, the lower the risk of diabetes. So in fact, bottom fat can actually be protective against the risk of diabetes. So in men, everybody when they get home needs to pull out a tape measure and measure their waist circumference. And I don't want you to email me your results. <laughs> However, in men, we know that there's a high risk of heart disease and diabetes with a waist circumference above 102 centimetres and really the target is less than 94. And that's placed around the belly button essentially. In women, our target is 80 centimetres but the cutoff point is 88. So these are figures that we use every day when we see people, and the best predictor of diabetes risk is not overall weight, as I'll show you a little bit more detail a bit later, but it's really central fat. So how much fat we've got around the organs, and we can estimate that by measuring our waist circumference. Physical inactivity, and we're all guilty of that. Some medications, such as steroids that I mentioned to you, but also pre-diabetes, which is the condition that people, when their sugar's slightly elevated, so if the GP says, or someone says that, that you've got a touch of diabetes or pre-diabetes, we know that one third of people who have pre-diabetes will go on to develop diabetes per se. There's gestational diabetes, as I mentioned to you, diabetes during pregnancy. So we get all women who develop diabetes during pregnancy to have a glucose tolerance test, the glucose drink test, six weeks after they deliver, and then probably every two years at least, if not more often, they should be screened for diabetes because women who've had diabetes during pregnancy are at much higher risk of developing diabetes down the track. And if we can pick it up very early, then we can institute measures such as lifestyle measures and even some medications that might prevent the progression of diabetes down the track. And finally, polycystic ovarian syndrome. This is a condition that manifests in, tends to be overweight women, but not always. Um, who have excess facial hair or, or acne or irregular periods and we know that that's also associated with a higher risk of diabetes. So in women who are diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome the recommendation is to screen for diabetes. Alright, so this is some work that was done by one of our colleagues in the diabetes and metabolism group many years ago now but has been used and, and, and updated since then and what David Carey did was he did a DEXA scan. So this is a scan that's used to measure bone density. We've all had a bone density scan, but you can actually map out the areas of fat on the bone density scan. And this is obviously a cartoon. But what you can see here is this little box here, which is around the middle where the belly button's about in the middle here, that is the strongest predictor of diabetes and heart disease and much more so than leg fat or whole body fat or arm fat. So we know that we can measure that by waist, but if we do it scientifically and we measure the amount of fat in that little box, that is a very strong predictor of diabetes risk down the track. Now, to illustrate that point, I've got a couple of sumo wrestlers here, and despite the fact that these uh, individuals have markedly increased body fat, their risk of diabetes and their risk of heart disease is very, very low. That's while they're actually actively wrestling. And if we do a scan of these people, and this is a, a representative MRI scan, what you can see here, this is where the belly button is, this is the front, this is the back, and this is the right and left. And if you do a scan through the middle, you can see this black area here, which is 
body fat. And that's subcutaneous fat. That's fat under the skin. And that fat is actually not harmful. It's the fat here around the organs that is the one that contributes to heart disease and diabetes. So this is a scan of when they're actually actively uh, wrestling. But if you look at when they stop wrestling, you can see here now the amount of subcutaneous fat is much less, but the amount of fat within this little area has increased markedly. And that is uh, an MRI of the sumo wrestler when he's not actively wrestling, and that's when they have a much higher risk of developing diabetes and heart disease. So we know that that fat moves, we know that physical activity reduces it, and it really, I think, highlights the importance of that type of, type of body fat in predicting diabetes risk. This is some more work carried out in the diabetes and metabolism group. And essentially this is the conclusion, that people who are not overweight may also have increased abdominal fat. And I think that's a really interesting point. This is uh, data that they've measured in that little central fat window that I showed you before. You know, they've measured the amount of fat in that window. And these are people who have higher amounts of body fat. And this is how sensitive to insulin they are. And if you look at people whose BMI is less than 25, so this is a measure of, of body fatness in a way. So if you're lean, you can still have high amounts of central fat, all the pink dots. So just because you have a low body weight doesn't mean you can't have increased central fat. And conversely, if you have a BMI over 25, so you're overweight, you can have low amounts of central fat. So we really know that measuring the amount of fat around that central window that I showed you in yellow is much more important than just simply looking at someone's body size. And we know that there are some people who are overweight who will never develop diabetes, and that's because they've got low central fat and low liver fat. We know that some people who are lean have a higher risk of developing diabetes. So it's becoming more complicated and more complex, and that's one of the things that we're trying to research at the moment as to why that might be the case. And this is just highlighting some of the genetic influences. So we know that the amount of central fat that you have in that window is strongly genetically determined. And these are from some twin studies, again done at the Garvin Institute, which show that if you look at identical twins versus non-identical twins, you can see here that this line of fit is very, very tight in the identical twins, but in the non-identical twins there's a lot of scatter. And what this data actually suggests is that the amount of fat within the central window, uh, the central fat, is very strongly genetically determined. And again, within the Garvin, that's one of the things that we would love to try and work out in the next few years as to what genetic factors actually govern how much fat we put down in that central window. All right. So what about the treatment of diabetes? I'm going to talk a little bit in the next few minutes about new medications because I think they're really interesting. But the reason why we're trying to do that is to keep everybody's blood sugar. This is a glucose meter that we commonly use to test glucose readings. What we want to do is keep glucose readings like this. We don't want our glucose meter to show that. <laughs> I think they've got the wrong talk here. Um, so what's the treatment? Well, the treatment is weight loss, weight loss, and weight loss. So these are really important. And when we say weight loss, it's really fat loss, which is what we're trying to say. So if we can reduce our body fat by 5%. Now, that's not a huge amount. We don't need people to lose 25 kilograms to reduce the risk of developing diabetes and to improve diabetes control. Studies have shown that if you can lose 5% of your body weight, that reduces the risk of all the metabolic complications associated with diabetes. So if someone weighs 100 kilos, losing 5 kilos can lead to much improved metabolic health. We can do that through diet. We can do it through exercise. There are now surgical procedures that are available in hospitals to lead to significant weight loss, bariatric surgery. So the old stomach stapling, gastric, uh, sleeve gastrectomy, uh, and more complex operations that lead to markedly reduced uh, weight. They're currently available, particularly through the private health system, but there are some uh, people who can get operations on the public system. Psychological factors are obviously very important when we're talking about managing diabetes but also social factors. And I came across this interesting study, and apologies if anyone's actually seen this, but I thought it was interesting. This was a study published now in Obesity Research a few years ago, which basically looked at what happened to people's weight when they were married and when they were not married, and as the US say, unmarried. So what happened is, if you look at men, when they were sep became separated, they actually lost a little bit of weight, but it wasn't significant, it was only 20, 270 grams. But women lost quite a, a bit more, double the amount of weight when they were separated. 
When they got married, men put on 0.7 kilos and women put on a kilo. And this is just an average amount. So women, unfortunately, uh, do worse here, but they lose more when they get separated. I don't know what that means, but anyway. And this is what the authors say in the paper. I'll, I'll send you this paper if you're interested. Um, marriage increases the opportunity for eating. That's how they explain why people put on weight when they get married. And they say that, this is not me, but them, people who leave a marriage lose weight to increase attractiveness and those who get married gain weight because of weakened motivation for keeping weight down. <laughs> Now, I've asked Leslie Campbell, who's one of my mentors, as to why this might be the case. And she strongly has told me the answer and has explained it. And I said, why are married women fatter than single women? And what she said was that single women come home, see what's in the fridge, and go to bed. Whereas married women come home, see what's in bed, and go to the fridge. I don't know. <laughs> so... On a more serious note, um, how do we treat diabetes? And back in the 1990s, it was very easy. We started a drug called metformin. Everybody should be on it. Then we started sulfonylurea, like glycoside. There was another drug called acabose, but we didn't use that very much because it increased the risk of um, uh, flatus. And then insulin was the way to go. As I said, half the people who develop diabetes will be on insulin after 10 years. In 2015, it's much more complicated. There's metformin, sulfonylurea, acabose. There are some drugs called the glitazones, rosiglitazone and pioglitazone, but they have received some bad press because of a high risk of heart disease and not, we're not really using them terribly much anymore. There are new drugs here, which I'm going to concentrate on in the next couple of minutes, which are really useful medications because as opposed to most of the other medications that we use, they lead to weight loss rather than weight gain. And then finally, insulin therapy. So this is what goes through our minds, this table, when we've got people sitting in front of us as to which drug we're going to pick. And as you can see here, there are many different choices. So there's no one right answer in the terms of the type of diabetes therapy that you should be on. So we know that people's blood sugar levels, which is here in, in blue, go up very early on, even before they develop diabetes. So we make a diagnosis here when blood sugar levels are above the normal range, but we know that then they're slightly elevated for many, many years prior to diagnosis. And what we're really trying to do by screening people for diabetes is pick diabetes up very early on here so that we can maintain some of these other problems. So you can see here that insulin resistance, an inability of insulin to work as well as it should, occurs early and it gets worse in that pre-diabetic phase. Insulin production you would have thought might actually go down when you develop diabetes, but in type 2 diabetes, it tends to go up before it goes down. And there's this interesting hormone called GLP-1, and that's really, really important. It's secreted from our gut after we have a meal. I'll show you in the next slide how that works, but it's a really important hormone that increases how much insulin we make after a meal. So just remember GLP-1, and that, those levels are lower in people with diabetes. So what happens is when you have a meal, you have carbohydrate, fat and protein, and that's broken down into glucose, amino acids and fatty acids, and there's these cells in the gut called L cells, and they secrete this hormone called GLP-1. And GLP-1 is a designer drug almost. It increases how much insulin you make in the body, and it also makes you feel fuller. So it sounds perfect. And that then goes to the pancreas to increase insulin secretion. So if we can make more insulin and make you feel full so you eat less, sounds great. And that's essentially what the drug companies and the drug designers thought would be a good target to improve diabetes control. The problem with GLP-1 after you make it in the body is it's broken down within a few minutes by this enzyme called DPP-4. And don't worry what that stands for. But the problem is it's inactivated very quickly. So you need to design a drug that's not going to be broken down by this enzyme, otherwise it's not going to be useful. So you can't just give people GLP-1. And what they've done is develop drugs that stimulate the receptor that GLP-1 binds to in the pancreas to turn the receptor on to make more insulin. But they've also designed drugs that actually turn the enzyme off that breaks down your natural GLP-1. So these are two very nifty ways to try and improve the amount of insulin that we secrete in the body. And many of you who have diabetes will probably be on these drugs. Does anyone know who this is? 
This is the Gila monster. And the Gila monster lives in the Arizona desert and it only eats a few times per year. And interestingly, many years ago, um, Ralph and I isolated this uh, uh, molecule called Exendin-4 from the saliva of this creature. I don't know how he came across to think about this, but this uh, Gila monster in its saliva makes what's called Exendin-4. And interestingly, Exendin-4 stimulates the GLP-1 receptor in the pancreas that I showed you before. And the drug companies then develop this drug, Exenatide, which is a synthetic version, a made-up version of Exendin-4, which is resistant to breakdown. So they found that the Gila monster made this molecule. They copied it and changed a few of the, 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 uh, the, the structure, a little bit of the structure, so that it wouldn't be broken down by DPP-4, and so it would stimulate the GLP-1 receptor that I spoke to you about, uh, and that would increase the amount of insulin that you make and make you feel fuller. And that's essentially the drug that we've got available to us today. Oops. So there are two drugs that are called GLP-1 medications, two classes. We've got exenatide and we've got liraglutide. These are given by injection. The beauty of them is they lead to weight loss. As opposed to all the other diabetes medications that we use, these drugs lead to weight loss. One of the major side effects, though, is nausea. And it slows down the, way, the, uh, the speed at which the stomach empties. And for some people, and we don't know why some develop it and some don't, there's a higher risk of nausea. That's not how the drug works. That's not how it makes you lose weight. Even people who don't get nausea lose weight. And, it's, and there are monthly drugs in the pipeline. So there are some weekly medications. So we now have medications that are available in this class, which are available in Australia, which I haven't listed on this slide, which can be given once a week and you just go, you give it yourself, and you don't have to take the medication the rest of the week. And there are some monthly ones, as I said, which are becoming available. So this will be a revolutionary treatment whereby you're able to have your monthly shot of your diabetes drug and then turn up to the GP again a month later. Now there's also the DPP-4 inhibitors called the Glyptons, and these are tablets. They don't lead to weight loss, but they don't lead to weight gain. They're not associated with nausea, and they're taken as a daily tablet. So I think these have been really interesting medications that are now available for the use of di to treat diabetes. Now the other class just before I finish of diabetes medication that are useful are these ones called the SGLT2 inhibitors. Now you don't need to remember really what that stands for, but it's an interesting concept. So what happens is that blood and glucose are filtered through the kidney and the body is very good at conserving energy. So what it does is it extracts out the glucose with this transporter sitting in the kidney and you reabsorb all of the glucose back into the blood. That doesn't make sense when you're trying to lower sugar levels. So again, what the new class of drug does is it actually blocks that enzyme. So it stops the sugar being reabsorbed into the body and therefore it goes out into the urine. So you can predict what the side effect of this drug is going to be. If you've got more sugar in the urine, there's going to be a higher risk of urinary tract infections because bugs like sugar. And there's also a higher risk of thrush. But one of the major benefits of these drugs is the reduction in weight, because you're basically peeing out glucose. And you can see here, this is one of the studies published recently, if you look where you start from and you look at the highest dose of these drugs, you can see that weight comes down by an average of about three kilos or so, and that's at um, 24 weeks. So as opposed to all of the medications that we currently use to treat diabetes, these drugs, the SGLT2 inhibitors, are associated with weight loss, which I think is, again, a really a great addition to the, the group of medication that we can use. As I told you, there's a relatively high risk of urination because you're putting out more sugar and that drags water with it, and also urinary tract infections. So I tend not to give these medications to people who have a high risk of urinary tract, in, tract infections but also an increased risk of genital infections, uh, including vaginal thrush. But these are uncommon side effects, and if people are aware of them, then they can be very useful medications. And the government has just relaxed the restrictions on the use of these drugs so that we can really use them in most people with diabetes, except those who aren't on any other tablets. The examples of these are dapagliflozin, uh, it's a funny name, I only just learned how to say that, canagliflozin, and the trade names for SIGA, and there are a number of other medications in this class, but they can be very, very useful. So, in summary, and hopefully I haven't got too much over time, diabetes is common and becoming more prevalent. 
It is important to screen people with risk factors for diabetes. And we haven't talked about type 1 diabetes, as I said, because Dr Gunton will talk about that later, but particularly for type 2, as I've discussed. And finally, I think, and most people would agree, I think that preference should be given to diabetes medications that lower weight rather than increase it. So on that note, I'd like to say thank you for your attention. I look forward to seeing you a bit later for the question time. Thank you.